What's going on, guys? Last Tuesday, I sent Leo the suit out to the Detroit Auto Show to show you guys some big horsepower offerings from Jaguar, Mercedes-Benz, and Ford. And some of you complained that we didn't show enough green technology, no hybrids or diesels or blah, you know, any of those, those slow-moving cars. But I may have a solution. Somewhere in between, we've got the Fisker Karma plug-in hybrid. Hybrid electric drivetrain, 0 to 60 under 5 seconds, top speed of 125 miles an hour, and a true beautiful luxury car. Is it going to work? I don't know. So, Leo the suit, take it away. I'm Matt Farrow, you're watching Garage 419. I'm with Henrik Fister, head of Fisker Automotive. It's really a pleasure for you to be with us and appreciate it. Matt Fair, our host, talks about your cars all the time. So this is an important uh, opportunity to really get behind the, the essence of it. I know that we're talking about the first luxury plug-in hybrid, but it feels like there's, there's so much more to this. So I really like you to tell us the story. It's deeper than that. Thank you very much. That's right. I mean, <clears throat> we, we are really looking into seeing how the industry is changing, and I think we're leading that change. And I woke up, you know, three, four years ago thinking, how is the future going to look in the car industry? Are we all going to be driving around in ugly little two-seater, underpowered electric cars, or is it still going to be exciting cars? And when I came across the technology, the Q-Drive technology that was really originally uh, developed for the U.S. military, I realized that there was a possibility that we actually can get back to creating some desirable, sexy cars that we love. Well, and that's the other part of it. As a designer, I need to ask you, this is a shape that has some, some great distinction. How would you define, rather than a suit, how would you define the, the cues that represent Fisker design? Well, I think the cues are low, wide, and a lot of sculpture. This is just really what, what I like is the proportions. I, I think you've got to start out by getting the proportions right. And that's very difficult if the proportions start out in the engineering department with an idea from marketing in terms of packaging a whole bunch of people. So we didn't start out this way. We actually start out with technology and the idea about creating a fantastic looking design. And, and as a driver, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that, that it's not just green, it's not just uh, art, it's going to perform. Right. Tell me a little please about it. Well, we actually have some of the best suspension engineers on this uh, project. One of them is an ex-Porsche uh, suspension engineer. We have one of the engineers that worked on the Ford GT40. So they're setting up uh, the suspension in this vehicle. I actually gave them my personal BMW M3 to uh, make sure that they uh, benchmark the uh, steering. And then we got a Maserati quad port, a BMW 7 Series, and a Jaguar XJ to benchmark. So we actually really are looking to create a very exciting sports sedan that actually does for the average consumer over 100 miles per gallon. And to make sure everyone understands, this is a production model right here. This is not a concept car, this is a production car. That's right, it's running out, it's running out, rolling out to customers in the end of this year. Can you give me a number of how many miles of testing or how many computer simulation hours we've done with this car? We have done hundreds and thousands of computer simulations going through obviously all the, the crash simulations and everything else you have to do. Uh, the stress simulations, uh, actually even driving simulations, everything is almost done virtual today until you get to the final. Uh, it's really verification. We are building up to 60 prototypes, which are all going through different testing, uh, suspension testing, separate steering, uh, battery testing. Several of these prototypes are already running around. We've done a lot of battery and, and, and powertrain testing. So you still have to go through a lot of prototypes. You still have to crash a certain amount of cars but it's slightly different than it was in the old days where you started out with prototypes really early. Okay, and take me through, um, well, actually one question. In the tailpipe area, I'll call it that, there's a hybrid HZ. I don't want to assume, what does that mean? Hybrid Hertz. That's because we have an external and internal sound system, which, uh, because an electric car is very quiet, so this is there for two reasons. It's not to make noise pollution, it's there to actually alert drivers in parking lots and it will have a sound that is similar to a jet fighter. Okay. So it's very interesting, very exciting. And it's going to not be too intrusive when you drive around the parking lot, but it's to alert kids or older people or blind people. And then we have a sport button inside the vehicle. So when you really feel excited and wanting to drive fast, you actually get that accompanied by a really exciting sound that's hooked up to the accelerator. So it's a little bit like driving a 
jet plane with four wheels. So let's recap. Changing the ambient lighting in an interior, that's passe. Yeah. Now we can dial in the sound. That's right. Talk to me about sunset, because that seems to be the next iteration to kind of expand this look and feel. Is there... Yeah, I mean, what, what we wanted to show today was really that we have created an aluminum space frame that's very flexible. Okay. And we have one of the best engineers, our chief engineers, an ex-BMW guy that worked on the BMW C8 space frame, the Rolls-Royce space frame, and he's now together with Norsk Hydro and of course a lot of our engineers developed this aluminum space frame. And uh, basically we have people, you know, we even have a, a person that, that worked on, on uh, a space frame from one of the larger automakers as well. And the idea was to get the space frame flexible enough that we can make a range of cars and we do simultaneous engineering so we can actually build these cars for a very affordable price. So the sunset we're showing today would cost less than 15% to develop than the original four-door cost and it really shows the derivatives that we're going to come out with. The sunset is not scheduled before uh, 2011 but it is a production ready vehicle. Well I was going to I was going to respect the automotive uh, prices have not been announced yet but do you want to share a range of of where these cars are relative? Well, we have announced the price for the uh, four-door, and that's going to be $87,900. Right. We're now including the sunroof, uh, solar roof yes. as a standard. We have not announced the price for the uh, Karma S yet. It will be more expensive than the four-door. It's a little bit too early. It's not before 2011. And right now, we're concentrating on the production version of the Karma four-door. Of course. So, with absolutely no disrespect intended, when you talked about looking at the auto industry in a new way, it's not that you've got a building full of thousands of fiscal employees. You've approached something where you're kind of collaborating. Would you kind of clear up my explanation of that and tell me what you're really doing to make this happen? Well, we're collaborating, first of all, with a lot of suppliers. Okay. You know, with our factory in Finland, it's called Valmet. We're collaborating very closely with them to get the cars built. Uh, and that's the same plant that's building all the Porsche Boxsters. We're collaborating, obviously, with Mac Magna, which is doing the interior. Uh, we have an engineering group called EDUC. We have Valeo, who's doing the headlamps, tail lamps. We have Michelin, uh, who's doing the tires. We have CF, we have TRW. There's a lot of companies we're partnering with, which are, are suppliers to the industry. We're also having a purchasing agreement with General Motors, okay. where we, for instance, buy the two liter uh, Ecotech engine, which is turning the generator. Yes. And we're buying a few other things from General Motors as well, and exchanging ideas. And but going back to the, <coughs> going back to the partners, we purposefully, in my opinion, I'm asking, do not use the word vending. And right. you're not just giving them a spec to build. Are they involved in the design and engineering? Yes, they are. I think they're, you know, we want to, I believe that a good engineer is emotional involved. And uh, I, that's why we bring all the engineers into our facility and we work together with them. I think that's very important. And I think to work at something exciting as this, you need to have people that really love it and want to work on it. Of course, we have some very set goals for what they have to achieve. Uh, but I think it's exciting to work on a new product that you actually see is coming out the way you're, you're working on it. And of course, we also have our, our joint venture partner, which is Quantum Technologies, yes. where we're developing together with them the, the, the drivetrain. And they are, of course, also directly involved into Fisk Automotive because they're joint venture partner. And my last question, I'm sure there are a lot of people that would ask, why is it taking a General Motors so long to bring something to the market? And it seems like we're getting there a lot quicker. Well, I think, you know, first of all, when you go into a higher price range, it's all, always easier to bring out new technology because you can command a higher price. Okay. And our price is more than double the price of what the Volt is announced to be. The second thing is, we have a production of about 15,000 cars a year. And obviously a company like General Motors have to go through a lot more testing for liability and other things like that uh, than we have to do because that's an internal thing you pose on yourself. Uh, we're saying we are pretty confident with our technology, we've done a lot of testing, we've fulfilled all the rules and regulations that you have to fulfill and we don't feel we need to go beyond that. Now other large companies, they by themselves go beyond that uh, because they have a lot larger volume and you know that's probably some of the reasons. But I still think, as far as I can see, that General Motors will be the first mass manufacturer to come up with a real plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Could be maybe a softball question of it all. Is this your dream? Is this going the way you've envisioned? 
You know, <clears throat> I've had many dreams throughout my career. The first was just to design a sports car, which became the Z8 BMW. Check mark. And then, you know, it was to design Aston Martin, got that done. And then it was not really a dream to get in the James Bond movie with one of my cars, but it happened. So I've just come to sort of in the mode, whenever I reach my dream, I set a new one. It's got to be a big one. So when, you know, I've done all that stuff, my next dream was really to have a car company that produced a range of cars that was really different. And when I, come across, when I came across this technology, which is the plug-in hybrid technology, I really felt this is the chance where we really can put together a business case that's going to work. And I see this as being the future, and yes, it's a, a dream, and I'm happy to have a huge team that is part of this dream. Well, I'm often, I'm often guilty of looking at this too much like a business person, but emotionally, here's a car that will attract people if they want to make a statement be at the front of what's going on automotively and do it with plug-in hybrid, the first luxury vehicle that looks great and performs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Leo, and thanks, Heinrich, for coming on the program and telling us about your two new beautiful vehicles from the Fisker Automotive Group. When your resume includes the BMW Z8 and the Aston Martin DB9, it's pretty obvious that your next car is going to be one hot-looking piece of machinery. So I'm not entirely surprised at all that they're just ridiculously good-looking cars. What I'm a little interested about is that your optimistic goal of selling 15,000 of them a year. Look, with a brand new hybrid powertrain that hasn't been long-term reliability tested from a company no one's really heard of and introducing an $87,000 luxury car to the market at a time when no one really has any money or any credit, it's an optimistic goal. So I'd be interested to see how close you actually come to meeting that goal uh, in the coming year. But either way, I look forward to getting out to LA, getting a drive in the Fisker Karma as absolutely as soon as possible. Because, I mean, a car that looks that good, let's just hope it drives as good as it looks. And if it does, I will be the first one to stand up and say, golf claps all around. Till next time, I'm Matt Farah, and you've been watching Garage 419.